advanced alternative model, so you, where you could take a little bit of risk, but meet the criteria in MACRA for your physicians to get that 5% bump in pay, plus not be held to the criteria of MIPS. So this was a new ACO that came out. Um, um, and, and, and by the way, the, the, and this result, this just came out last week. I don't even know. I, had, I, sent, I sent this article to my analyst yesterday and said, could you update this slide? So I don't really know what this says. Maybe we could read it together. <laughs> but the 2000, so the re 2017 results came in just last week for the ACOs. And, and what we started to show is, is the ACOs are now saving the government money. Last year, they lost the government money. But what's happening is more and more, um, as they stay into these ACOs longer and longer, organizations are learning how to create savings. And last year, there was like, a, I, I thought it was about a $300 million return to the government for organizations after paying out bonuses for the ACO. So we're starting to see results. Quality scores have improved. We're starting to see results. So I'm going down this whole ACO track because I, I want to get back to this question of the market said they were never going to happen. And then they happened. And they happened in a big way and they're now showing results. And, and so, several years ago, I was working with four critical access hospitals in northern New Hampshire. They wanted to talk about a, they wanted to come together because they knew they had to take out costs. And they, they had formed this kind of joint venture around a shared service company where they get together once a month. They did group purchasing and things like that. They were trying to create some savings. And we went in and did an assessment and said, yeah, you can do all that and you're gonna save about 1% of your costs. And they, they, need, they need you to think about a 10% change in their cost structure. And so we became, the conversation became one around a population health strategy. And how do we move to a population health strategy? And, and, the, and, and so the, how we thought about it, um, first thing we did is we sat down with them and we created a 10-year projection of staying in the fee-for-service world. And we modeled in assumptions around, you know, kind of the impact of the Affordable Care Act. You know, the, the Medicare prices, you know, what we would talked about. We, um, impact of Blue Cross. In New Hampshire, Blue Cross plans pay their beneficiaries $250 to leave rural communities to get their outpatient surgery in ambulatory surgery centers in Concord. And those were big money makers for, for these, these rural hospitals. And all of a sudden, that volume is going away. So we modeled in some of that. We modeled in some of kind of the fact that you just couldn't go to uh, Blue Cross and say, we need a 10% increase because our volumes are down a little bit. Dish payments were getting zeroed out. Um, you know, we mailed in, and then we assumed expenses, you know, regular inflation, pre inflationary pressures on wages. Um, and when we did this, it became a holy cow scenario. It's the cows. It could have been a lot worse picture, but uh, anyway. This was the combined impact on their operating income. This was the combined impact on their cash flow going out 10 years. What became really clear is that anybody that was looking out beyond a one or two year budget cycle, looking at all of the impacts of the deterioration in volume from the market consolidation, you know, the, 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 the market draining some volume out, the, the, the pressures on price, for those who are interested in staying in fee-for-service, it's, it's not a dog that's going to hunt for very much longer. And I've got, got a slide here I'm going to show you here in a minute to even prove the point. Is it next slide? Yeah, here's, here's, here is, I really look at this and say, this, you talk about the holy cow moment. So these are Medicare margins for all rural hospitals until 2013. And then here's rural, including critical access hospitals. This is excluding cause, the blue, including cause. And then around 2013, look what's happening to Medicare margins. When your payer that represents between 40 and 45% of your payer mix, we're seeing across the world increase, or across the industry, Medicare margins dropping like this. This, this is that carbon monoxide seeping into the room. The fee-for-service system cannot be sustained for very much longer. We've got to think about something else. And I would suggest the reason why we're seeing the huge influx into the ACOs and all of the new accountable care and all these new models is because people are looking out beyond one or two years and saying, it's not going to work. So let me ask you, would it, push back on that if you want. Be careful, I have, I'm armed. <laughs> Or, th or comments on that?
All right, the class I spoke with a year ago, I couldn't get by, I think we got through eight slides. Yeah, yeah. You guys are so sleepy, I think you're just sleepy. Yeah. Can you go back to how ACOs are incentivized to manage risk more effectively? So if they yeah. have an inherently high risk population, yeah. how is that not? Well, so, so if you have an inherently high risk population, I look at that and say, that's when I want to be in an ACO. The reason is because instead of a budget of $12,000, my budget might be $16,000. It's all built into the base year budget. And if I can really have an impact on that high risk population, look at the opportunity for margin. So I, 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 we actually would prefer, you know, you go to Vermont where the budget might be, you know, $4,000. There's not a lot of, <laughs> there's not a lot of <laughs> margin there to be made. Yeah. So I guess how is this shift going to happen? Like how, like, are you saying yeah. that it's not sustainable? To figure out so you jump to slide 37. <laughs> I, I look at this, these are market forces. We got a three and a half trillion dollar industry that all of a sudden we're seeing these types of events going on. So the decline in Medicare margin, couple, the reason why you're seeing that, two, two reasons, right? It's two, twofold. One is that, that, that price going down relative to cost. The other thing is, is inpatient volumes that drive, right? If you're going to be successful, it's about managing unit costs. In a, in a large hospital, 80% of your costs are either fixed or step fixed. About 20% are actually truly variable. Meaning that if you bring out a unit of service, you might only be able to save 20 cents on the dollar. The other 80 cents stays in. What happens is volume comes out. Yeah, you can save that variable piece, right? The 20 cents on the dollar. But that 80 cents on the dollar stays. And so, what happens is you, your unit costs, on average, go up as your volume comes out. This, this decline in Medicare margins is both the effect of Medicare paying less than your cost increases and volume coming out in the inability to dilute your huge unit, your fixed costs over units of service. Everybody understand? You guys take any economics classes here at Penn State? Or? That was my favorite class in MBA, was economics. Oh, I loved it. I have a couple. All right. First hand was there. Ah, no, ladies before gentlemen. What are you? I already asked a Yeah. How do you... You are a gentleman, right? Okay, all right. <laughs> how do you anticipate, like, the difference in the, in the baby food generation on Medicare and how, like, Medicare is essentially funded? Do you think that with the decline in the margins of Medicare, is that going to really affect the payers to come in the fact that it's going to accelerate the shift to a new payment system. We cannot sustain the Medicare trust fund staying in fee for service when we're paying for when we pay for sick care, we get sick care and a lot of it. That's what we're doing right now. This is about fundamentally saying we're going to pay for we are going to now allow enough resources to enable you know high quality sick care, but we're going to allow to invest in health care. And that's what's different. So I've got a way to think about that here in a minute. Well, yeah. Those 800, 900 ACOs, are they majority in like track one? So they haven't had to have. Yeah, I, I, just, I just read the numbers yesterday on the flight out, or two days ago on the flight out. It was like 85% like of the Medicare ACOs are track, track one at one. this point, so maybe even 90. Do you think of those in the track one, do you think they'll repeat or drop out? Well, they, 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 under the proposed rules that just came out uh, last month, um, so every year Congress comes out or, or, or CMS comes out with proposed rules uh, and then they have a 90 day comment period and they finalize these rules. In the proposed rules related to the, um, the, the affordable care, or, excuse me, the um, ACOs, they're saying you can only stay risk, not taking, non-risk bearing for another two years. Oh, nice. And then even the track ones then have to flip. They're still trying to figure out what to do with rural because, you know, rural is kind of in, in a tough, you, only about 25 to 30 percent of the total spend is spent in rural. Now, if you lose money on all 100 percent, where's that money coming from if you're only getting paid 20, you know, you know, you know 30 cents of that dollar? So really interesting. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, two good questions. Uh, one of them is, uh, you spoke about Goldman Sachs investing in all this company. The, the which one? Goldman Sachs. Yes, yes. So uh, it's investing in the healthcare because it's probably going to make some money from the ACOs? Well, maybe, or they're just trying to prop up primary care physicians' compensation. What do you think? 
agree with the uh, organization that they, if you save some money, then some amount of card goes to them. Well, so, so probably what they're doing is they're investing in this Allidade to get some type of return. That if they do create savings, you know, you know, I don't know what the deal is, but I assume they're at the trough first to get return on that $400 million. So another thing is that, you said that, so if an average is $12,000 is released from the government, and then the uh, ACO spend a thousand for the care of the person. So they will be saving their money and then 50 percent goes to the government and 50 percent is going to be kept for the position. Wait, I'm not following the question. Okay. So uh, on the average you said that uh, the uh, ACOs get a budget of around $12,000. The ACOs get a budget of say $12,000, yeah, $12, right? $12, yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, and they spend around $1,000. In the primary care practices themselves. So, so they submit, primary care offices are submitting claims that total $1,000 for that year. $1,000. Well, well it's, it's a small amount. You know, an E&M, a 99213 might pay 80 bucks right now. Uh, so a, a 99213 is the evaluation and management code. It's the bread and butter evaluation and management code that's billed by primary care practices. When a patient comes to see them, it pays about 80 bucks right now. Expensive. So I, I think, Josh, what you're asking about is there's two pieces here. Yep. One is a uh, thousand of the twelve thousand is controlled is taking places in the exchanges in the physician practice. The physician practice is betting that the actions they take in their offices can squeeze savings out of the other eleven thousand yeah. dollars per head. Yeah. Okay. Keeping them out of the hospital, keeping them away from expensive uh, delivery that mechanisms. So they're they're betting on themselves to control that. Yeah. Because in the past they didn't have any access to the eleven thousand dollars. Now in the ACM model, any savings there, they'll get half of. And that's, that's the bet that they're taking. They're, they're taking them absolutely yeah. correct. Yeah. What time is it? How much time we got We've left? We've got uh, thirty minutes. Okay, good. I thought you were going to say like ten, and then no, we were. And, uh, I want to just belabor one point, just to because it's hard to see the line where the years are on this graph is zero percent margin. Anything below that is negative. It's hard to see the negative sign. Maybe it's oh, my eye. okay. But most of these lines are in the negative space on the Medicare margin. Yeah, so, so it, it, the margins were going up. They hit a crescendo here, and now they're just coming down. Right now, the rural hospitals, it, you know, kind of excluding critical access hospitals, negative 7%. And, and that's 40, 40 to 45%. How much Medicare? Was 40% of your payer mix at Elton? 50% in Altoona. 50% of your payer mix on average. It's an older demographic. So it's tough to make it up on volume when you're losing that type of money. Okay, so, so, so are, are we follow me? And, and, then, and then here's, um, so this is Alex Azar. Excuse me. Um, the, uh, uh, secretary, the new secretary, um, he replaced Tom Price. Tom Price, I don't know if you guys are familiar with him. He was an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, he was appointed by Trump originally. His whole thing was really to dismantle a lot of these payment provisions. He was an orthopedic surgeon. He did not want payment to change. He, he's gone now. We got Alex Azar that said, we're going to fix health care. And he said, I fundamentally think we're paying for the wrong thing. We're going to change the payment system. I agree with him 100%. We are paying for the wrong thing. We are getting the wrong thing. And so what he said is that, you know, one of his four, so this was his four points. Wow, that didn't go on. This were his four points. We are going to, um, you, know, get, uh, you know, HIT to have consumers better understand what they're doing, increase transparency on price, um, reduce government burdens, which is a key theme out of current administration, and then use MACRA in the Innovation Center to transform payment. This is very different than Tom Price. So this whole movement to its alternative payment systems, not only is it a market force, it now is also a confirmed government force. So, so anyway, the government's not forcing anyone to jump into these ACOs. This is organizations, I would suggest, looking out beyond a one or two year budget cycle and saying, uh-oh, this fee-for-service dogging going to hunt. Right now, we can still get into and play around in these ACOs, taking no risk or minimal risk, and learn about a whole new payment system because it's the future. Yeah? Do you think there will be any financial penalties for organizations that don't move into value-based payment systems? 
Yeah, let me show you. <laughs> Do you think this is going to turn up or is this going to continue to go down? Yeah. That's the financial penalty for staying where you are. Next year, the government now is going to take 1% off the top. So for the last three years, they were taking 0.75 off because of the government we could, off of the price increase. Now going forward, it's, they can take a full percentage, a whole percentage point off the top. That's the penalty. And that's why I said it's kind of carbon monoxide. We don't, we don't really feel it. We just look at our bottom lines. You're looking at your bottom line in Altoona and saying, Work harder, <laughs> cut costs, <laughs> get more volume. You know, these are the, these are the, this is what we, how we react as hospital executives to this. The good news for me in rural is, is you know, I've, I've probably turned around 300 rural hospitals, or we, we yeah, because 70% of your business drives right by the front door of that rural hospital. All we gotta do is